So our next speaker is Chris Trevutis. Um, he's a co-author on this paper with Tanya Collis. Um, she's the head of conservation at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, where she has worked for 16 years. She's a graduate of the Buffalo State Art Conservation Program. I don't believe she's here, but Chris is. Here. Oh, you are here. Nice to meet you. Um, so Chris is a painting conservator in private practice in West Hollywood, California. Over the last 13 years, he has been developing the refined and refining the modular cleaning program. One section of the MCP deals with solvents and solvent mixtures. <laughs> Richard Wovers and Chris wrote the chapter, The Cleaning of Paintings, in the second edition of the Handbook for Critical Cleaning. And their talk is entitled, Getting Out of a Sticky Situation, Developing a New System to Remove Matrix and Clean Fossils from the La Brea Tar Pits. Thank you. So, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to be giving a little bit of background to our project, and then Chris is going to be giving more of the specifics about um, the new cleaning system that he's been consulting with us on. All right. So, this project concerns the preparation of fossils at the La Brea Tar Pits Museum. The Tar Pits Museum is part of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County family of museums. It opened in 1977 as the George C. Page Museum of the La Brea Discoveries, um, which was rather a cumbersome name, and uh, we recently renamed it the La Brea Tar Pits Museum, which is certainly accurate, um, if slightly redundant, because La Brea means tar in Spanish. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, the name derives from Rancho La Brea, which was the original Mexican land grant given to Antonio Jose Rocha in 1828. Here's a view of the original 4,400-acre rancho, which was later subdivided and developed. The last owner of the site that contained the tar pits was George Allen Hancock, who recognized the scientific importance of the fossils that were found on his land, and he gave permission to researchers to excavate there. During the years 1913 through 1915, he gave exclusive rights of excavation to the County of Los Angeles and the newly founded Museum of History, Science, and Art, which became the Natural History Museum. Then, in 1924, he gave the 23-acre property to the County of Los Angeles with the stipulation that the um, park be preserved and the fossils be properly exhibited. So to make a long story short, this is why we have about three and a half million fossils from the La Brea Tar Pit site in our collection today. This is a view of Hancock Park today. Um, just to orient you, um, this, is, this is called the Lake Pit, and then over, if you were to look right of here, you would be looking at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, which actually split off from the Museum of History, Science, and Art in 1964, and is also located at the same Hancock Park site. So, um, as I said, this is what we call the Lake Pit, and these uh, sculptures of a mammoth family with poor mommy mammoth hopefully, hopelessly um, mired in the tar, have traumatized generations of children <laughs> who have come to visit the tar pits over the decade. Um, however, the point is to show how the fossils got into the tar. They were all essentially entrapment events. This is um, one half of a large diptych painting by Charles Knight that shows the range of animals that were found in the tar pits. Um, over on the left, you're looking at uh, giant ground sloths. Some dire wolves are looking kind of hungrily at them. You can see horses and camels in the background and a saber-toothed cat. Um, but in addition to these large mammals that are shown, there are also fossils of much smaller animals that are found in the tar pits, like reptiles, amphibians, even snails and insects, and plants, seeds, that are all very important to the research that goes on there. These fossils that are coming out of the tar pits, are, um, they're preserved by virtue of having been immersed in the tar rather than an, uh, a mineralization process that we normally think of for fossils. But they're still called fossils because of their prehistoric origin. Um, the researchers used the fossils to evaluate 
the ecology in the late Pleistocene and consider how the climate has changed since that time compared to now. And in case you were wondering, um, the climate back in the late Pleistocene was much cooler and damper in the Los Angeles basin than it is today. Um, understanding climate change in the past is a great jumping off point for being able to talk about current climate change concerns and other environmental concerns, which is one of the goals of the museum. And uh, we're also hoping in our new cleaning uh, project that we're able to tie in with some sustainability goals as well. So, um, well, mammoths are always a, a popular draw. This is a, a large Colombian mammoth that's on display in the museum. But it's interesting to recognize that most of the fossils found in the tar pits are actually predators, and the most common are dire wolves. So this is a display on the lower right, I mean the lower, yeah, right, of um, over 400 dire wolf skulls that represent about 10% of the total number of dire wolf individuals that have been recovered from the tar pits. Um, the theory is that the larger mammals would be entrapped in the tar and then the predators would move in to feed on them and then become trapped themselves. So these kind of clusters of entrapment events um, may, be, may not have gone on on a daily basis, but happen from time to time and account for these masses of fossils that are found in the tar pits. Um, the tar seeps became active in this area about 50,000 years ago um, during the late Pleistocene, but they're still an active presence in the park today, and they just occasionally bubble up in new places, um, sometimes to the consternation of people who live and work in the, in the neighboring um, residential and business areas. And entrapment events still occur today um, with unwary urban wildlife, although um, the active seeps are fenced off for the safety of the public. This was not always the case. In 1951, um, this man jumped into the lake pit to rescue a dog and ended up needing to be rescued himself. Um, you'll be happy to know, though, that both the man and the dog uh, were okay after what must have been a very uncomfortable cleaning process. And I bet he wished that he, we had developed a new cleaning system back then. So uh, to move on to some of the work that's going on today, this is what we call Project 23. Um, these are large tree boxes that contain material that was removed when LACMA built a new parking garage on the northwest part of the park. Um, they encountered a fossil-bearing asphalt deposit during the excavation, so as part of um, the recovery, they boxed just masses of this material into these tree boxes. There were 23 tree boxes in all, so that's why we call it Project 23. The paleontologists are working through this material layer by layer, box by box, and are now on box 14. This is a display in the museum to show how the fossils are embedded in the matrix. The matrix is basically tar with sed sediments like clay, silt, sand. Um, what this display doesn't show you are all the microfossils, like teeny tiny bits of small bones or shells or seeds that are also embedded in the matrix and are very important for research and also need to be recovered during this process. So um, going back to the material that's in these tree boxes, the paleontologists generally um, soften the matrix first by applying, applying solvents and then carefully remove the matrix from around the fossils with hand tools. One of the most sensational finds to come out of Project 23 was this um, nearly complete articulated Colombian mammoth who's been nicknamed Zed. Uh, that's because um, when they discovered him, one of the researchers said, wow, this is complete. It looks like all the parts are there from A to Z. That's what he said. So um, that was a really exciting find. But as I've said, um, it's also the microfossils that are in this material are often even more important for the research, so they also have to be recovered. The um, larger bone fossils are further processed in the museum's uh, fishbowl lab, which is visible to the public. 
One of the main solvents used to clean the fossils is N-propyl bromide. And although the work is done under fume extraction, the solvent could be potentially hazardous if it's not handled properly. So rather than wait until we had a problem on our hands, we decided to reevaluate our cleaning systems and see if we could come up with some methods that would be safer for staff and friendlier to the environment. So since we're talking about cleaning systems, I called Chris and um, asked him if this was a project that he might want to get involved with. And Chris is going to take it from here. So obviously, I did want to get involved with it. So as Tanya said, there are two types of materials to be recovered from the tar, the microfossils and the macrofossils. And each requires a slightly different uh, preparation. Um, so the microfossils, we go from these big slabs of, of asphaltic matrix to bits and pieces. And I was, you know, this is a very, um, by, by our conservation standards, very crude. The method for breaking these up is a screwdriver. And then after cleaning with, with the solvent, you get this thing with, with larger grains of sand and fossils and microfossils. And finally, the, the fine bits are sorted, as you can see, with a brush to separate the microfossils from all the other yucky stuff. So the current practice for the microfossils is you soak the, that aggregate uh, matrix in biodiesel to liquefy the tar, and that's suspended on a, a mesh material. So the tar and the fine material, the small grains of sand and the silt and the clay sink down to the bottom. And then after that, it's rinsed in the n-propyl bromide and then sorted out. And about nine paint pounds of matrix yields about a half, pounds of, half pound of final material that doesn't go through the sieve. Um, so this is different from most cleaning things where you have a little bit of stuff to remove from a large thing that you keep. This is, you know, uh, you know, we're recovering, we want about 10% of the stuff we put in there. The 90% gets washed away. And um, complicating the project, well, not complicating, but um, making it hard to compete with the biodiesel is donated to the, for the facility. So that makes the price point for changing systems a little difficult. And then, as Tanya showed, um, the microfossils are removed. Um, solvent is put around to soften the matrix so they can kind of scoop the fossil out. So that's a whole different, um, they're using the same chemical, but it's a whole different cleaning process. And then here's a fossil. Now it's in the ventilation system where they're actually removing that residual tar with solvent. And then here are the, the fossils that have been recovered. And you notice there's some staining from residual stuff kind of still oozing out. So what we want to do is replace the current practice with a better system, uh, both for cleaning the matrix and getting the, recovering the microfossils, and then cleaning the fossils themselves, the, the big fossils. And we want it to be safer for humans and environment, more sustainable, low cost of materials, and no residue from the cleaning system. Um, we don't want to affect protein analysis, future DNA type work. Um, we can't use heat or excessive heat because we might denature proteins. Um, there are a number of constraints on what we can, what we can do, uh, and preferably faster or higher throughput. And what would be really great, and I'm beginning to think this may not be possible, is to separate the tar from the solvent. So we kind of have our sloppy mixture of tar and solvent, and then some way to kind of precipitate the tar out and reuse at least some of that solvent. Um, so we're approaching the problem through collaboration, um, determining the solubility parameters of the tar fairly specifically, and then find solvents or mixtures of solvent that will optimize this process and also possibly give us the ability to precipitate the tar and recover some of that solvent. We're going to examine processing options, um, you know, whether a bath or a spray or something works better, and then test it and then do a final field trial. And it's worth mentioning that we've kind of just begun doing this. Um, so collaboration, Tanya herself, uh, the staff at the tar pits, obviously, and the people who literally wrote, wrote the book on critical cleaning. And that's where Richard and I have a chapter. And also John Burke 
a longtime conservator WAC member, um, has a chapter on T's solvent solubility systems. So there are the uh, cleaning lady in rocket science, Barbara and Edward Kenigsberg, and their company, and they've agreed to help with this. So um, determining the sol solubility parameters of the tar, and this is very recent. Um, it was actually last Saturday when I did this. The Hansen solubility parameters are specifically taking uh, Hildebrand solubility, which is a thermodynamic calculation, and separating it into a dispersion component, a dipolar component, and a hydrogen bonding component. And those are the three, essentially the three things that hold organic molecules together to make them solid rather than gas. So um, the way we're doing this is using the HSPIP, Hansen solubility parameters in practice. Obviously, uh, Dr. Charles Hansen is the Hansen of Hansen solubility parameter, parameters. And then this is uh, his collaborators are Stephen, Ab Doc, Professor Stephen Abbott and Dr. Hiroshi Yamamoto. And this is a great video. I'm just not showing the video, just a few stills from it, where um, Professor Abbott talks about how you determine the solubility parameters of polyisoprene, which is a balloon. And he's doing this while on vacation with materials found around the house. So here is his list of what he's going to use. Um, ethanol is gin, acetic acid is vinegar. Um, acetone and ethyl acetate are different kinds of nail polish remover. Um, Sinoline, sineol rather, is eucalyptus oil. And limonene, you can kind of see the lemon down in that corner. It's squeezed from the peel of the lemon. So here's the first thing, and you can kind of see the puddle of water down. He put water on the balloon, and not surprisingly, nothing happened. So it gets a score of zero. And he's gone through a number of chemicals, and unfortunately, the video isn't fast enough to show the balloon exploding. He put a drop of the uh, eucalyptus oil on, and the balloon just kind of went completely nuts, exploded. And then in the background, you can hear his backup balloons exploding because it splattered. <laughs> and so you hear the one explosion, then pop, pop, pop. So anyway, all the, you can see which got zeros, which got one. And so all this is entered into the HSPIP program. And so they're the solvents and their scores, um, the solvents and their scores here. And you click on a button. And you get this, which is the solubility sphere. So just from the stuff around the house and the vacation home, he could determine the area of maximum solubility of polyisoprene and which solvents dissolve that material, which don't. So the way the Hansen space works is each solvent is a, is a point in a three-dimensional space. And the solute is a sphere. Any solvent that works is within that sphere. Any sol solvent that doesn't dissolve that material is outside the sphere. And then the center of the sphere is the point of maximum solubility. So did the same thing with a few more solvents and no kitchen equipment. Um, so here's an array of solvents and a couple solvent mixtures. That's about 20 mils, whoops, sorry, wrong button. 20 mils of solvent, seven, mil, seven grams of the matrix into them, and you can see what is dissolving and what isn't. Um, and so I put that into the HSPIP, and there is the solubility sphere of the tar. So there were a few surprises to me. Uh, one is that delemonene, which I was the, the staff at the tar pits were saying, let's use D-lemonene, it's, it's really safe, um, which it isn't, but it's you know sustainable and comes from fruit, so how bad can it be? Um, and what you'll notice is it's actually, oh, you can't really see it, it's actually seg segregated the deposit into like a more coarse material, a finer material, and then the, the tar on top. Um, that's the only solvent that did that, including then propyl bromide, which they're using to rinse. The other one that surprised me is how good a solvent biodiesel is. Um, again, I just assume biodiesel, you know, it's, they're getting it for free, so that's what they're using, but it actually is an optimal solvent. Um, so what is D-lemonene? It's a green solvent. It's derived from citrus peel, lemon, uh, and orange, and it's purified by distillation. 
and it's considered a safe solvent. Uh, if you look at it on Wikipedia, it says it's very safe. But if you look at it on a chem MSDS or a safety data sheet, you see its NFPA health rating is three, which is not exactly safe. And to me, the biggest problem is it oxidizes to form a residue. And remember, one of the criteria is we don't leave anything behind. And so my concern is that as that material permeates into these, um, the fossils, that if it doesn't all evaporate out before it oxidizes, we'll be leaving some organic material behind. So what is biodiesel? It is neither VIN nor the clothing company. Um, and to my, I, I assumed it was the chicken fat that you put in a modified biodiesel and when you're riding behind them, it smells like McDonald's. It's not. Um, it's actually chemically processed. It's a methyl ethylpropyl um, ester of either vegetable oil or animal fat. And again, much to my surprise, it turns out it's used to clean up oil spills. Um, so they'll put it on an oil spill, it'll dissolve it, spread it out so that material can evaporate faster and um, float it up to the surface so it can be skimmed more efficiently. The new wonderful thing, which we have uh, the, the scientists at the, at the Natural History Museum found this, a geoscientist, um, is using ionic liquids. And I'd heard of these but never have played with them. They haven't really been used in conservation either. Um, but it's a new class of solvent and it's literally melted salt. Um, if you bring table salt up to 800 degrees Celsius, you get a liquid, it melts. And that is an ionic liquid. So these solvents are ionic materials that are melting at room temperature. And interestingly enough, they've been proposed for extracting oil from sand in the tar sands as part, part of refining oil that gets shipped down through Indian reservations and everybody's very upset about. Um, but they're also being uh, looked at for cleaning sand that's been contaminated by oil spills. And apparently they can recover something like 95 or 99% of the tar, the oil out of a, the sand that's been contaminated on a beach. So the sand they put back down after being washed with this is p more pure, has less hydrocarbons in it than sand pretty much on any beach because there's enough oil from discharges and leaking ships that there's you know, always some hydrocarbon contamination of sand on, the, on a beach. So that's very exciting. Uh, and in this, this little picture they showed, there's the bitumen, the tar. That's the ionic liquid, and the sand is down at the bottom. And then you rinse the ionic liquid out of the sand after you filtered it out, and you get very, very clean sand. The couple of disadvantages of this, which you kind of don't get until you read the fine points of the, the paper that sounds so great, the bitumen is dissolved in toluene, which kind of takes the point out of being healthy and stuff. So um, this might be really cool to use in combination with the biodiesel um, for you know kind of the final step in cleaning the fossils rather than immerse, immersing them in um, the n-propyl bromide. So um, you might ask, what about the MCP, since that's my general, um, <laughs> what I think about most of the time. So, this is something that doesn't work yet, but the idea is that we will sp say we want to remove DeMar varnish from oil. Admittedly, DeMar varies from batch to batch and history of the aging, but the idea is you can play with solvent combinations and you have the two spheres, one what you're trying to remove and what the substrate is, and you can play with mixing solvents and it'll tell you how good a fit that is to dissolve what you want to dissolve and not dissolve what you don't want to dissolve. And that's it. Any questions? Anyone have questions for Chris and Tanya? Can you, exp Can you explain a little bit more, Chris, about the ionic salts? Because I don't understand how that will affect the tar if tar it has no ionic component. It, it actually separates it, it doesn't miss, it's, they're not miscible. So what you do is you kind of shake it up mm -hmm. and it separates the tar and the sand so you get those three phases. So the sand falls out the bottom, you get the recoverable ionic liquid and the tar is floating ah, on top. Got it, thank you. Uh, I can't pronounce them. <laughs> 
Uh, it, the, the one that this article was, was a benzene ring with a couple other things thrown off, and I'll, I'll send you a picture. <laughs> That's right. How, how easy are biodiesel and ionic liquids to get a hold of for the average? I'm assuming this particular ionic wow. liquid, liquid is probably not easy to get hold of, and I'm also assuming it's really expensive. Um, it doesn't, it's not miscible with oil, so that's not an issue, but it does go into the, their sand, which has to be washed away. So there'd be a loss of that material as you do the final rinse on, and it is miscible with water. So um, that's, that's an issue, and, and honestly, I haven't looked at that. But the biodiesel they're getting for free, so um, that we can't compete. What kind of volumes of material need to be processed throughout the whole uh, you project? You saw those tree? Yeah. Those are filled with material that needs to be processed. Okay. So it's enormous. excavated when the building was built in 1977. Um, the foundation of the building was excavated and that material was saved as well. And they're still working through that too. So there's a lot, there's a big backlog. And also not, not directly affiliated with the Natural History Museum, but they're building a subway through there. So they've also excavated much more material that isn't on their plates, but also needs to be recovered. And then LACMA is expanding, and we anticipate that there'll be more material coming out of that expansion. So we, we, can, see, we can see where this is going. 